Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the first colloquium in the Lent term series of the new year, 2016. And we are delighted to begin with um, the 1684 professor of music, uh, Nicholas Cook. Um, I'm tempted to say he needs no introduction, and that's largely because he wrote the introduction, the very short introduction, which uh, introduced a generation of musicologists, really. Uh, to the topic. It's the book, one book we all recommend to students before they come to university, and indeed while they're here, uh, to keep mining it. But of course, through from that work, through to his more uh, contemporary work, uh, released, recently um, released book, uh, Beyond the Score, Music's Performance, and Music's Performance has been, as many of you know, at the centre of many of the things he's been doing while he's been here with us in Cambridge. Um, but this, this talk today comes out of um, a British Academy Wolfson Professorship, um, which has been occupying his time of late, um, a, a project which will result in a book, um, and we're all very much looking forward to that at the end of, well, let's say, next year, would that, would that be? Yes. So a talk arising from his most recent research project, no further ado, introduce you, Professor Nicholas Cook. Well, thank you. And sometime around 1893, a mainly female string orchestra was rehearsing at the Croydon Conservatoire of Music under his regular director, Samuel Coleridge Taylor. Someone referred to him as black, a slightly impolite term. At that time, British people of African ancestry generally referred to themselves as coloured. As Coleridge Taylor's first biographer, Beric Sayers, tells the story, one of the girls retorted indignantly, Please don't call Mr. Coleridge Taylor black. He is only black outside. Well, she had a point. Coleridge Taylor's father was a medical student from Sierra Leone, but he left Britain in 1875, just before his son was born. The future composer was brought up in Croydon by his unmarried English mother. And at the age of 15, he entered the newly established Royal College of Music, where he studied co composition with Charles Villiers Stanford and was seen as the outstanding figure in a cohort that included Gustav Hulse and Ralph Vaughan Williams. Already in college, he was reading Longfellow, and 1898, the year he graduated, saw the first production of his cantata Hiawatha's Wedding Feast, which rapidly became a sensation on both sides of the Atlantic. For a decade, ousting Messiah from the top spot in the world of massed choral music, and that was quite something. Coleridge Taylor Society sprouted across North America, and if in the end the Coleridge Taylor phenomenon proved short-lived, the principal reason was his sudden death in 1912. We may call his death sickness pneumonia, wrote the American civil rights activist and pan-Africanist W.E.B. Du Bois, but we all know that it was sheer overwork. Now, Du Bois wrote about Coleridge Taylor, indeed was personally acquainted with him, because, though brought up in an entirely white environment, Coleridge Taylor became deeply involved in issues of music and race from his early 20s, and not only musically, but also to some degree politically. As we'll see, he and Du Bois met at the first Pan-African Conference held in London in July 1900. Ostensibly then, the composer started off white inside, as the girl at the conservatory implied, but reconstructed his identity as an adult, and that makes him an obvious case study in the role that music can play in the transformation of identity. But of course, it wasn't as simple as that. The literature and Coleridge Taylor's life, which is fairly extensive, becomes mainly from outside academic music studies. This literature includes a novel by Charles Elford, near the beginning of which a violin teacher named Joseph Beckwith sees a small black boy playing marbles in the gutter with a violin case next to him. And you can read this extract for yourself. Now, the story is true, or at least it's as Beric Sayers tells it, except for one thing. It was in 1904, when boarding an American train and hearing comments about his colour, that Coleridge Taylor retorted, I am an Englishman. At one level, his English identity and black skin coexisted successfully. 
He was comfortably, comfortably embedded in the professional and institutional structures of musical advancement almost from the moment that he enrolled at the Royal College. And if his skin was black, that of his wife, Jessie Wormsley, herself a Royal College alumna, was white. He shared the ambition of practically all English composers at that time, which was to succeed in Germany. And if from 1897 he incorporated certain African materials in his compositions, then that might be seen as, seen as falling into established traditions of exotic representation, interpretable as a function of London's position as an imperial metropolis rather than as an investment of personal identity. Catherine Carr, who wrote a thesis on Coleridge Taylor, writes that Coleridge Taylor's work is no different from those exotic or oriental works which experimented superficially with unusual foreign techniques, yet ultimately retain their Western heritage and syntax. She mentions Rimsky-Korsakov, Balakirev and Holst as other examples. But that is obviously not the whole story. There were a few black people in Croydon, but there is no evidence of any close acquaintances and hence a lack of role models with whom Coleridge Taylor could identify in this basic, because plainly and publicly visible, dimension of his selfhood. It was only as an adult and an established composer that he developed the extensive network of acquaintances with both resident and visiting West Africans and African Americans that leads Jeffrey Green, one of another of his biographers, to suggest that it was among these acquaintances that the composer had found his African soul. At the same time, because he was black outside, he was subject to the generally low level and not necessarily malicious racism of the day. There are stories of a boy in a choir outing, setting light to his curls to see if African hair would burn. Uh, of another student at the Royal College who called him a nigger, and that already in the 1890s was a slur. And of a clergyman who asked Coleridge Taylor if he really drank tea and ate bread and butter like other people. Boys routinely called out blacky as he passed. Just once, Sayer says, with evident approval, Coleridge Taylor responded by thrashing the use of his walking stick, though the events affected him severely. Coleridge Taylor's daughter, Avril, has a related story that must relate to when he was in his 30s. There were lads in Croydon, she says, who sometimes laughed at him because of his dark skin and what they said caused him great pain. When he saw them approaching along the street, he held my hand more tightly, gripping it until it almost hurt. And before that, his future in-laws had raised vigorous objections to his marriage on the grounds that the Negro necessarily belonged to a lower stage of development. Sayers comments that we should not blame them for notions which were common to the white race. And indeed, such experiences are entirely in line with other accounts of the black experience in London around 1900, even in professional circles. Theophilus Scholes, for example, speaks of white doctors elbowing a West Indian colleague out of the way and loudly asking, what's he doing here? But that racism is normal does not mean that you get used to it. And it's hard for us not to look askance at Sayers' claim that, in general, the colour line was not a source of discomfort to the young composer. Now, while the effect of such abuse is to force a racial identity upon you and keep it permanently in the foreground, it's only from Coleridge Taylor's early 20s that there's evidence of any overt identification with this African patrimony. Apparently referring to the period around 1897, Sayer speaks of the curious racial affinities that Coleridge Taylor felt for the work of Robert Browning, which she related to persistent rumours of the poet's Creole ancestry. Correct rumours as it came up, as it happens. Later, Coleridge Taylor became interested in the idea, which was to enjoy considerable currency in the 1970s, that Beethoven was black. Less circumstantial is the evidence of the March 1897 issue of the African Times, which contains a Liberian patriotic hymn that Coleridge Taylor wrote to celebrate the half century since the establishment of the Republic of Liberia, one of a handful of self-governing African states at that time, and uh, labor of Sierra Leone. Uh, 
But the best documented and most important evidence is Coleridge Taylor's involvement in the Pan-African Conference of 1900, which drew delegates from Africa, the West Indies, and America. According to Peter Fryer, the term had been coined, Pan-Africanism, it had been coined only the previous year, meaning that the conference can be seen as one of the starting points for the Afrocentrism that constituted an important strand of the American Civil Rights Movement 60 years later. Coleridge Taylor provided music for the conference. But beyond that, the nature of his contribution isn't clear, although a short-lived Pan-African Association was established on whose executive committee Coleridge Taylor served. But the political tenor of the conference <coughs> is indicated in an address to the nations of the world written by the conference's most famous delegate, Du Bois. The problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line, Du Bois proclaimed. And he followed this by calling for a comprehensive international program of education, enfranchisement, and decolonization. Du Bois' influence can be traced through Coleridge Taylor's life from then on. One of the last examples being a letter to the Croydon Guardian from 1912, prompted by a local debating group discussion of the Negro problem in North America. In it, and a follow-up, Coleridge Taylor cited Dumas as a mixed-race genius and pointed out that the coloured people of America did not go to that country of their own accord, both points that Du Bois had made. And Coleridge Taylor added, personally, I consider myself the equal of any white man who ever lived. Now, Jeffrey Self, another biographer, cites this statement in the course of an attempt to summarise Coleridge Taylor's self-identity. That Coleridge Taylor was proud of his paternal descent is undoubted, he writes. That he considered himself the equal of any man, we have the authority of his own word. That he considered himself an Englishman, we have on the same authority. Self then cites some of his compositions based on African themes and concludes that Coleridge Taylor's concern for the plight of the black race may have, been brought about, may have brought about a crisis of identity which may never have been finally resolved for the pull of his English environment and his European creative tradition for him was too strong to be completely vanquished by his coloured paternity. But there's perhaps a better way of thinking about this. Georgina Bourne and David Hesmond stress the importance of distinguishing between individual self-identity and collective identity in relation to music, on the ground that multiple identities may coexist within the same individual. Thomas Torino makes a similar point when he defines identity as the partial selection of habits and attributes used to represent oneself to oneself and to others adding that this is relative to specific situations. Seen this way, Coleridge Taylor might be thought of as having access to a number of more or less stable collective identities, ranging from his work with local music groups, such as the Croydon Conservatory, to his position as a distinguished English composer, and from victim of racial abuse to supporter of Pan-Africanism. In this way, he situated himself within collectivities that range from the local to the national to the transnational. But like anybody else, his individual self-identity was more mobile, a performance of those divergent and sometimes contradictory identities that varied according to circumstance. Well, is it possible to throw some light on this tangle of overlapping identities, both voluntary and enforced, by approaching the issue from the direction of the music? Just as there's evidence of Coleridge Taylor's involvement in African and African-American affairs from 1897, so there's a change in his compositional direction with titles such as Fantasia Stücke and Symphony in A from 1895 to 6, giving way to Hiawatha's Sketches, 1896, and African Romances, 1897. The latter, the African Romances, are songs written to texts by the poet and performer Paul Dunbar, apparently the first African-American with whom Coleridge Taylor developed a close personal relationship. In June 1997, he and Dunbar presented a joint performance at the Salle Erard 
that included Coleridge Taylor's Fantasia Stuka and Hiawatha sketches, with Dunbar reciting a selection of his own poems, some of which were written in African-American vernacular. Dunbar's father had been a slave in Kentucky. According to Avril, uh, Coleridge Taylor's daughter, the encounter made a profound effect on Coleridge Taylor. In this case, context, we should remember what is often forgotten that as a mixed race composer, Coleridge Taylor's blackness was as precarious as his whiteness. Perhaps the encounter with Dunbar opened up the possibility of seeing his English identity as a deficit. At all events, Avril continues that the encounter deepened his pride in his origins and his concern for black people and it inspired him with a feeling that there was a new philosophy concerning liberty to explore across the Atlantic. Indeed, it has generally been seen as sparking off Coleridge Taylor's engagement with African and African-American issues more generally, but there are two points to be made about that. The first is that, as evidenced by the Liberian Patriotic Hymn, this engagement almost certainly predated his first encounter with Dunbar, if only by a few months, and then we have a learned footnote about when ships arrived and stuff like that. The second and more telling point is that even before this, Coleridge Taylor had already given musical expression to a concern for oppressed minorities. Coleridge Taylor first set the words of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow as early as 1893, evoking the dignity and suffering of the indigenous Americans, the decimation of whose tribes had been more or less completed by the 1890s, Longfellow's Hiawatha had an obvious resonance for Coleridge Taylor. In Jack Sullivan's words, as a black man in a white musical establishment, he empathized with American Indians as outsiders, much as black Indians and Creoles celebrate what unites them at Mardi Gras. But the link that Coleridge Taylor forged between indigenous and African-American uh, identity is more, a bit well, between the indigenous and the African-American, the link is more direct than this. When Coleridge Taylor composed his overture to the Song of Hiawatha, he incorporated Nobody Knows the Trouble I See, a spiritual that was well known from the performances of the Fisk Jubilee singers, of whom more shortly. In this way, via Longfellow, Coleridge Taylor conflated the indigenous and the African American, and through the further link to his own, eth his own ethnicity, created an image of the African that was perhaps as much symbolical as it was geographical. Paul Richard sees Coleridge Taylor as a Pan-African, a self-defined member of an imagined supranational community, and draws a comparison with Paul Gilroy's Black Atlantic. But one might argue that it's the abstract of idea, idea of indigeneity and oppression that lies at the heart of this image. At all events, Richards draws a telling contrast between Coleridge Taylor's image of Africa and that of Elgar, whom he styles the self-doubting praise singer of imperial adventure. While Elgar was writing his pomp and circumstance marches, Richards observes, Coleridge Taylor had begun to express African and by implication anti-imperialist sympathies in his own compositions. Coleridge Taylor's involvement with Africa, however defined, is easy enough to trace in the titles, texts, and incorporation of ethnically marked musical materials within his compositions. But his first-hand experience of African and African-American music is more elusive. In London, he would have had access to the commercialized black, min black minstrel and coon songs that he condemned in 1904 as the worst sort of rot while self suggests that Dunbar may also have introduced him to some African songs. But more substantially, 1897 was the year when Frederick Ludan, who led one of the incarnations of the Fisk Jubilee Singers, returned to London after a world tour. From the 1870s, the Jubilee Singers, an a cappella choir formed of students of the Nashville-based historically black university of that name, had toured in order to raise funds from, for their institution. And in doing so, they disseminated their repertory of spirituals on a national and eventually international level. 
Ludan became a personal friend of Coleridge Taylor's, also attending the 1900 Pan-African Conference and serving on the Pan-African Associations Committee. There were Jubilee concerts in London during the 1890s and Sayers confirms that Coleridge Taylor attended them. It was through the Jubilee Singers, the composer wrote, that he first learned to appreciate the beautiful folk music of my race. Sayers says that, in particular, it was the quality of the voices that impressed him, and goes on to explain that, quote, the traditional reedy singing tone had been replaced by the purity of the tenor tones and the deep forward tones of the bass. The Jubilee Singers' repertory, much of it collected by the singers and their first music director, the white missionary George White, the repertory had from the beginning been transcribed into staff notation. And when he rehearsed the students, White did so, quote, with the same exactitude that he brought to their official repertoire of cantatas and hymns and popular song. He held his fiddle in hand so as to check the pitch and insisted on soft vocalization and blend. Well, that, that resonates with Samuel Floyd's claims about the successive refinements of the Fisk Jubilee singers. He cites a description from 1878 that refers to their most pleasing sweetness of tone, contrasts this with earlier descriptions of the singing of spirituals, and adds that this process of refinement was to continue generation after generation until audiences would no longer hear spirituals, even as the Jubilee singers themselves had first sung them, let alone as they had been sung by the slaves. In short, the sound image evoked by Sayers had been disciplined by or filtered through staff notation. I'll play you a little snippet of their singing from 1909. This is actually the Fisk Jubilee Quartet, so a subset of the, uh, the chorus, um, but it will still give you an idea of their vocal production at that time. The same might be said of the professional singers of the spiritual repertory with whom Coleridge Taylor, whom Coleridge Taylor heard and indeed performed with in America, such as Harry Burley, who collected and arranged spirituals, but was also a product of the New, New York-based National Conservatory of Music of America, at that time directed by Antonin Dvorak. Uh, Burley was also a pioneer of the American uh, of the African-American art song. And recordings of Burley singing, admittedly from a later stage of his career, exhibit a vocal style not unlike that, for example, of Paul Robeson. If in this way Coleridge Taylor encountered the spiritual tradition at one remove, his reception of it was also conditioned by the writings of Du Bois, with whom he kept up a personal relationship. But most important, he read Du Bois' most famous book shortly after his publication in 1903 and described it as about the finest book I've ever read by a coloured man and one of the best by any author, white or black. The final chapter is devoted to the genre of spirituals that Du Bois terms sorrow songs. And he interprets it as the repository of deep racial memory laid down in Africa. While the words change, Du Bois says, the music is far more ancient, and he cites the example of a melody handed down in his own family. 200 years it has traveled down to us, he writes, and we sing it to our children, knowing as little as our fathers what his words may mean, but knowing well the meaning of the music. Now, the idea of racial memory was more credible at the turn of the 20th century than it is now, and if Coleridge Taylor was indeed in search of his African soul, Green's phrase, then he might logically have seen the spiritual as a place where it was to be found. At all events, 
During 1904, Coleridge Taylor composed probably the most influential of his African works, the 24 Negro Melodies, Op 59 for solo piano. And they were published the following year by the Boston-based Oliver Ditson, Com Ditson Company, which is itself significant. As far as I'm aware, right screen, no American had been able to convince a mainstream publisher to consider a volume of black music before 1905. And as a matter of fact, it was Ditson who came to Coleridge Taylor and not the other way around. The volume included a preface by Booker Washington, alongside the younger and more radical Du Bois, the leading spokesman for the African-American community. That demonstrates the elevated circles within which Coleridge Taylor was linked even before his first visit to America. He sailed in October 1904, just as Washington was writing the preface. There was also a foreword, a foreword by the composer in which she developed the idea of the spiritual, as, the spiritual as folk song. In his preface, Washington had written that the Negro folk song has for the Negro race the same value that the folk song of any other people has for that people. And Du Bois's concept of racial memory is an appropriation for Pan-Africanism of the idea that had motivated the collection and arrangement of folk song during the 19th century more generally what Herder called Volksgeist, the distillation through cultural products of national identity. This is the context within which Coleridge Taylor positions himself when he writes, what Brahms has done for the Hungarian folk music, Dvořák for the Bohemian, and Grieg for the Norwegian, I have tried to do for these Negro melodies. He also claims that in contrast to the monotony and shapelessness of Indian, Chinese, and Japanese music, the music of Africa, I'm not thinking of American Negro music, which may or may not have felt some white influence. The music of Africa has all the elements of European folk song, and it is remarkable that no alterations have had to be made before treating the melodies. Now, those parentheses imply that he sees the African melodies in his collection, much as Du Bois described them as musical fossils unchanged survivals from a different, distant past, authentic repositories of an ancient identity. But there's a very obvious problem here. Coleridge Taylor's access to the melodies was in all cases through transcriptions. As I said, in relation to the Fist Jubilee Singers, the melodies had been filtered or reconstructed through the pitch and rhythmic categories of staff notation. And perhaps more important, Coleridge Taylor received them in the context of performance practices conditioned by staff notation. This is where there's such an obvious distinction between Coleridge Taylor and American musicians such as Burley, whose work as, and as an arranger and composer was grounded on first-hand experience of song collection in rural Georgia. In this respect, to borrow Du Bois's famous image of the two worlds within and without the veil, Coleridge Taylor might be said to have never been really within the veil, and his arguably naive approach to the transcriptions of African music from which he works underlines that. Two thirds of the 24 Negro melodies are African American, while others are West Indian or African. Only one, Oloba is from West Africa, and in his foreword, Coleridge Taylor singles it out as a highly original number. Normally, Coleridge Taylor prefaces his arrangements of the melodies, in which they are elaborated into short performal pieces for piano, with the original transcription on which they are based. But as you can see, in this case, there are two. So the first one is a Yoruba melody with text that he was given by a personal acquaintance from Sierra Leone. The second, as you can see, is a West African drum call, question mark, in the author's possession. Well, one might say that Coleridge Taylor's forms of words betrays a conception of music as an artifact rather than the trace of performance practice. And I know of no evidence that he was aware of the nature or variety of African drumming. Richards interprets this transcription as invo invoking the Yoruba hourglass tension drum and makes the bold claim that 
When played with suitable rhythmic flexibility, the drum call and first statement of the theme are perhaps the closest the composer ever came to evoking the actual sound and texture of African music. Well, here's the drum call and first statement of the theme as played by David Schaefer Godschalk, and you can see what you think. At one level, these materials are fully accommodated within the musical structures of the turn of the century common practice style. Typically of the 24 Negro melodies, Oloba is structured around three variations of the complete theme. They're separated by statements of the drum call, which is used as a kind of fanfare, as if to command attention. Also typically, there's between the second and third variations, a long episode freely based on motives extracted from the theme, which culminate in an extended version of the drum call. The piece ends with a coda that effectively prolongs the final tonic, combining melody and drum call in an increasingly fragmentary form. Coleridge Taylor employs standard compositional techniques of variation and development, such as integrating thematic motifs with open-ended harmonically directed textures. He creates a different harmonic interpretation of the melody's opening three-note motif on almost every occasion of its appearance. The pitch classes remain the same, but the harmonic or tonal context change. And he packages the variations into an ABA pattern that in its modulating second section and return to the tonic for the third carries a faint echo of sonata form. But that kind of technical description misses everything that matters. One significant feature is the nature of the original melody. As you can see, it consists of four phrases, each of four bars, largely made up of multiple variants of differing lengths of the opening GAF motif. The four first two phrases consist of nothing but those three pitches. The third begins with a rise to D and adds the remaining notes of the F major scale, while the fourth returns to the tessitura of the first two phrases, retaining C, D and E, but now at the lower octave. With the exception of the third phrase, the theme is singularly undirected in nature. Seen in terms of the common practice style, it complies, uh, comprises an irregularly spaced series of closing gestures. But the manner in which Coleridge Taylor sets it is highly directed. After the initial variation in which the melody is camouflaged through the addition of upper and lower pedals, the second variation introduces a swaggering Edwardian sound. The texture is now homophonous, homophonic with chromatic and often linear harmonies, and its 16 bars are extended to culminate in an overblown tonic cadence. <laughs> The swagger returns during the long, freely composed episode, now building into an even more overblown fortissimo climax. <laughs> returns once more in the final variation where the theme appears in triumphant augmentation marked largamente it's played in block chords interspersed with extravagant rising arpeggios redolent of the hotel lounge or palm court so here's the beginning of it mm -hmm. 
Now, much of the piece consists of extended climax building passages with underlying dominant harmony, ascending linear motions and dynamic build-ups creating a strong sense of forward motion. But what they lead to is often anticlimactic, out of proportion with what led up to it, and the effect is something uh, of bathos. The same applies to the glaring mismatch between the rhetoric of Elgarian swagger and Largamento on the one hand, and the harmonically undirected noodling scraps of melodic material out of which most of the theme is made. Moreover, the overblown, perhaps intentionally tasteless nature of the music is quite out of kilter with the urbane geniality and light touch that's far more characteristic of Coleridge Taylor, Taylor's music. For example, in The Bambula, another of the 24 Negro melodies, or the orchestral piece that Coleridge Taylor made out of it, the Bambula Op 75, and that's what I was playing before I started talking. All this suggests that we could perhaps interpret Holoba as a critique, a parody, or a sending up of Elgar's Africa, in Richard's phrase, the Africa of imperial adventure. Seen this way, the music constructs an identity through opposition, what Richards would call an anti-imperial identity, that of the collegial champion of indigenous peoples. Given the melody's provenance, one might even perhaps think of Coleridge Taylor creating a musical expression of the Africa of his father's people, an Africa, to be sure, that was hardly less fictive than Longfellow's America. At all events, this symbolic encounter between Coleridge Taylor and an imagined Africa results not in a seamless accommodation of the other within the structures of the self, as in the Bambula, but rather with what Floyd calls a dialogue between self and other, a sign of which is the violence done to the tonal, textual, and generic dimensions of a common practice style that emerges as less easily defined and more open to negotiation than is often assumed. Born and Hesmondhalge invoked the literary critic and historian Colin McCabe's description of narrative as a meta-language which, in its transparency, denies its own discursivity and assumes the status of the real. That description applies well to the Bambula. Oloba, by contrast, is thoroughly opaque, presenting itself not as imagined African music, but rather as a critique of attitudes towards the African. The impact of the original melody emerges from the tensions and contradictions inherent in Coleridge Taylor's score, rather than from any putative relationship to the actual sound and texture of African music. From this perspective, one can at least begin to understand why, in his book about the impact of American culture on European music, Sullivan describes the 24 Negro melodies as an extraordinary example of multiculturalism, an Anglo-Negro hybrid unlike, quite unlike anything else in modern culture. The first two chapters of Sullivan's book focus respectively on the spiritual and on Longfellow, in each case emphasizing the importance not only of Coleridge Taylor but also of Dvorak, who died in the same year that Coleridge Taylor wrote his 24 Negro Melodies. While Coleridge Taylor said in his foreword to that work that he aimed to do for American music what Dvorak did for Bohemian music, the association with Dvorak goes back to his college days. Self calls Dvorak Coleridge Taylor's mentor, even though they never met. A reviewer of Coleridge Taylor's early symphony in A minor, 1896, wrote that it may be said to show the influence of Dvorak both with respect to the character of the themes and their development. But it's not simply a matter of style and technique. In particular, their shared passion for Longfellow is revealing. In 1893, Dvorak told the New York Herald that he had been reading Longfellow for 30 years. And in Sullivan's words, he wrote a symphony from the New World, composed the same year, with a copy of Longfellow's poetry on his music stand, and the soulful sounds of black music sung by his most gifted student ringing in his ears, and the gifted student was Burley. In short, Dvorak linked Longfellow and African America in precisely the same way that Coleridge did, and was already bringing the spiritual dimension in the spiritual tradition into dialogue with classical composition while Coleridge Taylor was still in college. <laughs> 
Okay then, but what did Dvorak do for bohemian music? Sullivan writes that after his discovery that the African musical, the American musical establishment had no interest in African American music, Dvorak quickly resolved to do in America what he had already done in Europe, to mine a folk vernacular and convert it into art that would be both formal and accessible. Well, that's true, but there is more to it. The assimilation of Dvorak into the mainstream of Western classical music, in effect as a more accessible and colorful version of Brahms, has had the effect of flattening out his achievement both musically and ideologically. Born and Hesmondhaus suggests that because of its lack of denotation and compared with the visual and literary arts, music hides the traces of its appropriation, hybridities, and representation, so that they come over time to be naturalized and aestheticized. Musical elements that begin as markers of national or ethnic groups are constantly being incorporated within a changing common practice style. That goes for the modal inflections, irregular phrase structures, and other aspects of stylized folk idiom that are found in Dvorak's music. And the same applies in the ideological domain, where the naturalization and aestheticization to which Born and Hesmontals refer is key to the music's effect. It was in the same year as Coleridge Taylor met Dunbar that the Viennese music theorist Heinrich Schenker, who came from Galicia on the northeast border of the Habsburg Empire, wrote that because of his understanding of the German logic of music, Smetana was be able to present bohemian music in a perfection which will not be surpassed. Since then, Dvorak has also succeeded. His chamber music in particular, with its bohemian roots, is blessed with such outstanding German virtues that it justly seems to us most highly attractive. What might seem a purely musical form of politics acquires a broader significance when this quotation is juxtaposed with another, which dates from the year when Ditson published the 24 Negro Melodies. Guido Adler, who had moved from Prague to the Chair of Musicology at the University of Vienna, wrote that as the motivic material is taken from the national stores which the artists work up into classical structures, so may our higher statescraft join the particularities of the people into a higher unity. Seen this way, Dvorak's music symbolized and naturalized the hierarchical structure of the multinational empire. In America, however, its effect was quite different. Not so much because of the New World Symphony itself as because of what the composer said. I am now satisfied, he told the New York Herald a few months before the symphony's first performance, that the future music of this country must be founded on what are called the Negro melodies. These are the folk songs of America. And two years later, he, he proclaimed them the most striking and appealing melodies that have yet been found on this side of the Atlantic. Sullivan describes the, at times, ugly controversies that ensued among critics and the chattering classes, which had hardly died down by the time that Coleridge Taylor first traveled to America. He also points out the uncanny resemblance, even down to the wording, between Dvorak's pronouncements and those of Du Bois in the Souls of Black Folk, published just a few years later. If Dvorak, perhaps unwittingly, made a powerful intervention in American racial politics, it might equally be said of Coleridge Taylor's music that its symbolic meaning counts for less than the action that it prompted. Richards invokes Schenker's domain of musical logic when he writes that African elements are perfectly at home in concert garb, forming a seamless garment with the European elements. But the more important point is that they are perfectly at home in concert halls, those canonical sites for the performance of white middle-class culture. Sayers tells how in 1898 the audience at a provincial English performance of Coleridge Taylor's ballad in A minor knew that Coleridge Taylor was an Anglo-American, but assumed that this, was meant, this meant he was a white colonist. Sayers continues. There was a general pause of astonishment at the entry of a short, swarthy, quick-moving young man whose enormous head with its long black hair, broad nostrils, and flashing white teeth betrayed at once the race from which he came. Sayers adds that the pause was followed by a storm of applause, and he puts this down to the sense of fair play characteristic of our race as a whole and its relationship with the backward races. <laughs> 
And if in this way, through his music, Coleridge Taylor controverted expectations in England, he did so all the more in the strange land of prejudices, which he once dubbed racially segregated America. There was obvious symbolic value in the fact that, at his first concert in Washington, Coleridge Taylor conducted an orchestra drawn from America's most venerable military band, established by Act of Congress in 1798. As a report in the Georgia Baptist said, it was the first time that a man with African blood in his veins ever hurled a battle over the heads of the members of the great Marine Band. It is equally significant that the soloists and chorus were also black. But what is perhaps even more significant is the fact that of the 2,700 audience members, or 4,000 according to the Georgia Baptist, at least one third were white. Mass musical occasions such as this are performances of community, ritual acts in which everyone present is a participant. One might see them as playing the same community forming role that music did in the early days of slavery, enabling slaves drawn from a wide variety of African ethnicities to develop a unified identity as Africans or African Americans. But here in Washington, community was being forged across the color line constructing a liminal identity in which the normal social barriers of turn-of-the-century American society were temporarily suspended. Coleridge Taylor's host and the chairman of the local Coleridge Taylor Society was Andrew Hillier, who had been a slave in Georgia and was the first African American to graduate from the University of Minnesota. Four years after his visit, Coleridge, uh, Hillier told Coleridge Taylor that when we are going to have a Hiawatha concert here, for at least one month, we seem, as it were, to be lifted above the clouds of American colored prejudice. In short, music is a domain of social action, the consequences of which go far beyond music. As Booker Washington told Coleridge Taylor, Hiawatha, he said, acts as a source of inspiration to us, not only musically, but in other lines of endeavor. Musical meaning is mediated by situated experience. You can't read it directly from the text. Indeed, Coleridge Taylor is a prime illustration of this. To describe his music as Orientalist, because on paper it resembles Rimsky-Korsakov, Balakirev, or Holst, is to interpret his appropriations of black music as Africanisms. In Lawrence Kramer's words, signs of blackness against which the subject of the dominant culture can seek to define itself as white. But that's to oversimplify or misread a quite different play of, ident different play of identities. Coleridge Taylor wasn't in the business of constructing a contrafactual whiteness in relation to a subordinate, exoticized other. On the other hand, neither was he engaged in the kind of self-exoticization illustrated by the slightly younger Khakhozru Sapuji Sorabji, who made much of his father's Parsi ancestry and fabricated a story that his English mother was Spanish Sicilian. Brought up in London by his mother and without significant knowledge of his father's culture, Sorabji, originally Leon Dudley Sorabji, seems to have had no interest in the real India, rather weaving Parsi and tantric elements into a strictly imaginary orient. Depending on such things, the same notes can take on quite different meanings. It follows that the meaning of Coleridge Taylor's music, and of all music, is not something deposited in the notes and laid down for all time, but rather something that emerges through interpretation and is embodied in the act of listening. Concert reviews provide abundant evidence of how Coleridge Taylor's music was heard by his contemporaries. The evidence is, however, skewed. Despite Coleridge Taylor's impact in the black community, the vast majority of American reviews of his music appeared in the white press. A rare exception, however, is Sylvester Russell, who wrote for newspapers oriented to the African-American market and attended Coleridge Taylor's 1904 concert in Philadelphia, which included settings of Dunbar's text from the African romances. Russell insisted that the music, even those with African titles, had no African qualities. And that's probably what most people would think today. The musical signifiers of place and ethnicity lie predominantly in sound production and performance practice, 
precisely the dimensions that were eliminated in Coleridge Taylor's sources. Indeed, for us, the dissonance between Coleridge Taylor's skin color and his music may have the effect of marking his music as white, so for once unmasking the assumed color neutrality of the Western art tradition. But that was simply not how the experience of many composers, of many, sorry, that was simply not the experience of many contemporary critics on both sides of the Atlantic. To these white critics, the racial character of the music was self-evident, taken for granted. That means that they were implicitly constructing a relationship of self and other as they heard it, and in this sense, imposing a racially marked identity on to the composer, who, according to Sayers, hated the early criticisms which dealt equally with his skin and his music. There is perhaps indirect evidence of racial hearing in certain epithets that were applied over and over again to Coleridge Taylor's music, giving the impression of being some kind of code. August Jaeger's association of the composer's paternity and the freshness of his music is one example, and the word duly crops up in other reviews. References to the savage or barbaric quality of the music are ubiquitous and easily understood, though sometimes applied in contexts where there is, to modern ears, nothing remotely barbaric about it. Less predictable is the epithet clever, which Elgar used twice in a letter to Jaeger from 1898, and is equally pervasive. Again, Doris McGinty notes that early American performances of the Song of Hiawatha constantly elicited terms such as savage, barbaric, mysterious, and weird, along with descriptions of it as European, lacking the expected earmarks of an African heritage, which implies a racialized expectation that just because Coleridge Taylor had African blood, he must compose in an African way, regardless of the particular subject or nature of the composition in question. That is also the implication of an obituary of Coleridge Taylor that appeared in the Henley and South Oxfordshire Standard, according to which Massonet was once glancing through a full score of the, one of Coleridge Taylor's works, and without knowing the name of the composer, he declared that he was certain that the musician was of Negro extraction, basing his belief on the character of the music. And the same might be said of the apparently innocuous praise for Coleridge Taylor's orchestration that appeared in the Staffordshire Sentinel Review from 1899. We must look for an explanation in the African origin of the composer, the critic said. The apparent non sequitur comes into focus when juxtaposed with a memorial tribute written by Sir Hubert Parry, at that time principal of the Royal College of Music, and published in the Musical Times. Having commented on Coleridge Taylor's strikingly unoccidental appearance that explained the affinity between him and Dvorak in terms of some racial analogy, Perry records that, like his half-brothers of primitive race, he loved plenty of sound, plenty of colour, simple and definite rhythms, and above all, plenty of tune. Perry also draws heavily on another racial stereotype that, in Ali Ratzani's, Ratanzi's words, portrayed women, the working class, and inferior races as childlike and requiring the firm but benign hand of the white, middle, and upper class male. Rather than thirsting for intellectual analysis, Perry tells us, Coleridge Taylor's primitive nature delighted in stories. He himself said that he was mainly attracted to Longfellow's poem by the funny names in it. Perry concludes, it was the very simplicity and unconsciousness of his character which caused the racial motives and impulses to be revealed so clearly. Racism becomes fully articulate at the point when the intrinsically black nature of Coleridge Taylor's music is coupled to his lack of an African upbringing. And that's what the Times did in its obituary. In any of his works which one may take up, it is obvious at once that it has certain features in its, mel uh, African certain features in its melody, style of treatment, and use of orchestral colour, which distinguish it from the music of English composers. Yet, he was born in London. All his early environment was English, and he was educated at the Royal College of Music. So the logic is clear. If the racial character of the music is not due to enculturation, then it must be due to what Sayers euphemistically refers to as the biological reason. In other words, the scientific or rather pseudo-scientific theory that sought to define race through facial feature, texture of hair, 
or cranial measurement. And by the way, on which a paper by William Mayer, a medical student from Trinidad, featured during the second day of the Pan-African Conference. Such theories gave rise to what Rodano and Bowman call the more extreme forms of racial prejudice, according to which, for example, a music would sound Jewish because its performer could not escape a race-specific predilection for a Jewish metaphysics of music. Whether or not they subscribe to scientific racism, it's clear that many, probably most, of Coleridge Taylor's white friends and colleagues thought in ways that would nowadays be seen as racist. They believed that biological characteristics such as skin colour, shape of nose, type of hair and size of skull were associated with ingrained cultural and behavioural traits. In other words, that there were such things as distinct races and that they existed in a hierarchy. Sayers, who was himself a friend and wrote his biography at Jesse's request, provides a good illustration. On the one hand, as we've seen, he dismisses race as a source of discomfort and, seizes, and seeks to excuse Jesse's relations. He notes the racial quality of Coleridge Taylor's orchestration and his love of funny names, commenting of the latter that a cursory study of the Negro shows how true this is to his temperament. He even describes the composer's appearance in a way that is alarmingly suggestive of an ape. On the other hand, he condemns as brutal nonsense a publisher's description of the composer as a damned nigger, he'll never do anything more. And he cites Coleridge Taylor as a complete answer to all the biologists who generalise on the limitations of the Negro genius. What I said about the mobile performance of self-identity, of course, applies as much to Sayers as it does to Coleridge Taylor. But the point is that while underlying racial patterns of thought may coexist with personal respect and even affection, they are always capable of being mobilised by pernicious ideologies. And remarkably quickly, that's Daniel Goldhagen's message in Hitler's Willing Executioners. For at least some of these critics, as for those who thought about Jews as Rodano and Bellman describe, personal identity was a reflection of a fixed racial identity. Whatever you composed or played, whatever you said or did, you were inescapably black or Jewish. By contrast, what Tim Rice calls a constructivist rather than essentialist concept of identity stresses its performative nature and therefore the self-determination involved in identity work. Rice speaks of authoring a self through music and explains that there are two aspects of this. On the one hand, creating a sense of self-understanding or self-worth, and on the other, creating a sense of belonging to pre-existing social groups. Coleridge Taylor illustrates both. His statement that he considered himself the equal of any white man who ever lived speaks to a sense of self-worth gained through his extraordinary success as a composer and the position that it earned for him both within and beyond the social and institutional structures of English musicianship. As early as 1901, Jaeger, and this is the same Jaeger who told Elgar what he could and could not compose, wrote in a letter to the critic Herbert Thompson that Coleridge Taylor, quote, is too big a celebrity now to ever come near me. At the same time, Self's reference to Dvorak being his mentor expresses Coleridge Taylor's membership of the transnational community of composers to which his privileged position within cultured and political American and, uh, and political African American circles added a further dimension. Such spheres of Coleridge Taylor's experience bear witness to the mobility of identity construction. But that is the story of the Coleridge Taylor who was only black outside. It doesn't bear on the experience Du Bois famously characterized as Two-ness, two souls, two thoughts, two warring ideals in one dark body. Coleridge Taylor's dark body forced racial markedness on him, conditioned the availability of identities as for all black residents of Victorian and Edwardian England. But at the same time, it afforded his construction of a pan-African identity. And if Richards is right about Coleridge Taylor searching for his African soul, if that is he came to figure his whiteness as deficit, then the traces of that search may lie in his music. Earlier I suggested that Coleridge Taylor may have thought of the Sorrow Song, the repository of African racial memory, as the place where he would find his new identity. 
But as Simon Frith says, identity is not something we reveal or discover, it's something we create, and so we might think of 24 Negro Melodies as a site where Coleridge Taylor laboured to construct a new social identity, that of the Pan-African, a member of another transnational community, which is to say, a community more imagined than real. Sullivan writes that the Negro Melodies are richer and stranger precisely because their creator had one foot in each reality, his imagination set in the cotton field, his experience in the drawing room. That is Coleridge Taylor's version of Tunis. Considered as a symbolic representation of black identity, 24 Negro Melodies falls far short of Floyd's exacting, if vague, definition of a work of black music, a sonic temporal organism whose internal relationships express and communicate essentials of the Afro-American experience. But Martin Stokes writes that music and dance are not just static symbols, objects which have to be understood in a context, but are themselves a pattern context within which things happen. Stokes is talking about ritual, but what he says applies to music as performance more generally. I spoke of the negotiation of liminal identities that cross the colour line in American performances of Coleridge Taylor's music. In England, the massed choral performances of the Hiawatha Trilogy at the turn of the century afforded their amateur participants a surrogate experience of indigeneity, the thrill of identification with, a, with an exotic other. And every year during most of the 1920s and 1930s, in a last gasp of the Coleridge Taylor story, there were two weeks of summertime performances of the Song of Hiawatha at the Royal Albert Hall, at which soloists wore feathers, the chorus dressed up in Indian clothes, and everywhere there were children in war paint. As for the composer, Perhaps for him, the conductor's podium was the only public place where he could be sure of transcending racial politics. But then there was an occasion, just a few months before Coleridge Taylor's death, when Reginald Buckley floated him the idea of a West African drama with scope for native music, which Coleridge Taylor laughingly said would appeal to the savage in him. When Coleridge Taylor conducted works such as The Bambula, we might speculate that some part of him was playing the part of the imaginary African, the, the denizen of a continent on which he never actually set 